Well, Luke Kappa, here we are. It's our annual buyer's guide episode, plus, I guess, your questions. We got a ton of questions in this time, so mm-hmm. we're gonna do our best to get through a lot of them. Um, two points I wanna make. First of all, we just got a knock on the door uh, right when we hit the record button and someone just hand delivered some weird hippie soap or something to, for you, which is amazing. Are you like, you're washing yourself now or your hair? I've or? always washed my body. I okay. have not used shampoo for a while. And yeah, I ordered some like Castile soap, which is apparently like better than regular soap. Um, and you can only get it delivered if you order like 10 of them. So I'll be set on soap for like a decade, I think. Um, in what in what ways is it better? Uh, it's like, I think most soaps you buy these days have a detergent, which I still don't really get how that's different from soap, but like <laughs> strips a lot of oil away. I don't know. Someone who knows about skincare is going to just be like, Luke, you're a total idiot. That's not what it does, but it does seem to be, I mean, the company, I think it's pronounced Sapo Hill, uh, like places an emphasis on like not packaging in plastic, Mm. um, making an effort towards being less environmentally harmful. Mm. Um, but yeah, I literally just like, I saw it in Clark's in Crested Butte, bought one and then bought a lot more and it, got delivered and they were very nice they called me they said none of the addresses in crested butte would work um (laughs) and like made sure like really tried to get me that soap and now it's here somehow and you you went for the most expensive elite we will hand deliver it knock on blister headquarters door yeah right after you hit the record button for a podcast okay Mm -hmm. anyway well i can't wait to hear your further review of the soap yeah i mean it's soap of I already used it. Oh, you have? (laughs) Yeah, I already have one of them. All right, all right. Um, The other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, we're both alive. I feel like maybe that means we're slipping. Like we're not working as hard on the guide as we used to. Like if we were really working harder every year, wouldn't we be dead? Yeah, I mean, physically, I don't think being in front of a computer for hours on end will literally kill you. I think it has side effects. Okay. Mostly mental that could potentially kill you, but um, yeah. Okay, so you <laughs> Let's don't- hope that doesn't happen, like- <laughs> So you don't think though the fact that we survived the guide means that we're slacking? No, I think okay. the fact that we are still describing it as surviving and not, yay, we're done with the guide. Yeah kind of sums up okay how it is all right and we have been we there's been there was a lot of conversations this year for the like last i don't know six weeks of the guide where it just kind of dials up in intensity every week there there have been a lot of conversations about how we're getting more we're going to get more help in here and uh we'll be talking about that uh when we get to some of your questions in this episode but anyway um, congratulations on surviving the guide then, assuming it means that you weren't slacking, you know, or, or that we only got like your 8.9 effort as opposed to like your 10 out of 10 effort. Mm-hmm. Well, I've only heard about one typo, I think. I know. So far, That's, which terrifies me. Yeah, um, as it should. And I just like, I realized the other day, like, like when I first started working on the guide, like getting the hard copy was like, is like my baby. And now I finally came up with a good analogy for it. Seeing the hard copy in person is like, like everyone has that one type of alcohol that they got really, really drunk on yeah. and like can never ever drink again. Yeah. And immediately makes them think of the time when they blacked out on it. That's me yeah. seeing the print or really any part of the guide. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's where we are now. Yeah. I mean, you know, but like we like to say around here, like sometimes it's not about you, right? It's not about us. No. So we are delighted that a lot of people really appreciate the guide and that makes us feel good. So mm-hmm. you are allowed to have that kind of visceral reaction. There's a, there's a certain element, I think, of perfectionism 
that creates the like visceral reaction and seeing it. But I sure hope that the people out there who get their hands on it are like, this is real good. And I think it is. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For them it should be like a nice beer. For me, it's like Yeah. Reminds me of Burnett's in college. <laughs> Anyway, um, what do you want to talk about with respect to the guide? Um, There's a lot to cover. There's 200 and whatever, eight pages yeah. of it. Um, I think one thing we could start off with is we have our best of section in the guide, which is the products that we personally think are just really good. Yeah. Like for all of our other reviews, we're trying to focus on who is going to like this product. Yeah. The best of section is the products that we like. Um, it's also a fairly small section and doesn't leave us a ton of room to expand. So every year there's always some skis that, or some skis and products that just barely miss the cut. Um, so one thing I like to go over each year is those that sometimes people wouldn't otherwise know were pretty close. Um, and especially especially given last season and our testing being cut really short. Um, there were a lot of products that we think have a lot of potential to yeah. be best of next year. Yeah. Um, several on my end, most notably two from J skis that we got pretty late in the spring. Um, the slacker is their first touring oriented ski. And I mean, it's, it feels like a J ski, like all of J's, like while we hate to make that generalization for a lot of brands, J skis, I think, are one where it kind of applies. It's got a round flex pattern. It carves well. It doesn't, it's not crazy stiff. Um, and for a touring ski, it's not crazy light. Um, but I mean, just really intuitive and mostly for me, like also very playful, which is rare in a touring ski. Um, so that's one that I could see myself really getting along with, um, with Pause. more time. You've started to really like the phrase round flex pattern. This is something you like more than me. So I want to hear you define what you mean by round flex pattern. Just because I think some people listening to this won't really know. Okay. Because yeah. that's that's a term I never used. You started it. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. You 100% started it. I never, I never used. I used symmetrical which is more intuitive, but you used round. No, this is not true. <laughs> or maybe it was a Lindahl thing. It's not me. Okay, whatever. Yeah, so anyway, you, you just... can go check my reviews, but I've, I've never, for whatever reason, while I love the concept of a quote-unquote round flex pattern, that is not the term I'd love to use to describe it. So you are on the spot. What do you mean by this term you keep using? You use this more and more. This, by the way, happens a lot behind the scenes at blister i call luke out for falling in love with certain terms and i do this myself i think we all do it mine is literally i have fallen in love with the term literally and using too many commas i love commas (laughs) and paragraph breaks i love paragraph (laughs) breaks and commas but anyway you're let's back up round flex pattern for those listening who may be curious what exactly do you mean essentially a ski that has tips that flex similarly to the tails. So a more, what we apparently know as an Austrian flex pattern is when the shovels or tips are significantly softer than the tails, essentially round. Like you think of the flex pattern, like a circle and it's symmetrical, um, or like a semicircle. I don't know. Hmm. Tips flex similarly to the tails, which for me tends to make a ski that's more forgiving usually has a bigger sweet spot, usually doesn't require you to be pressuring the shovel shovels all the time to get it to perform well. Okay, fair. And again, to be clear, we're all pretty big fans of that more symmetrical flex pattern, more consistent flex pattern. And what I've said for years is, I don't really care how soft or stiff the ski is per se, but if you are gonna give me a soft front half of the ski, don't go gnarly stiff on the back end. I like I like consistency there because mm-hmm. I think it ends up in a big sweet spot. Okay, mm-hmm. we can carry on. I just, it's good to define terms. All right. Um, especially when they're not mine. <laughs> okay. Um, next ski that also has a round flex pattern, uh, the J Skis Hot Shot, which is on the other end of the spectrum. The slacker's really light or pretty light. Hot Shot is very heavy, um, but 
still has a good amount of rocker, still has uh, those tails that aren't super, super stiff. And I mean, mostly I'm really excited to ski it in really bad conditions to see just how good its suspension and is and how damp it feels um, because there are not many skis out there that are that heavy with a metal laminate that are also not super, super directional and traditional skis. Um, so yeah, those are my two from J skis. Any on your end? Yeah. The Blizzard coach East one Oh six for sure. Um, was a big fan of that ski this past season. Um, had a couple very memorable days on the mountain on those. Um, <clears throat> that's got, I think a real shot at a best of, uh, for next year. And also an, uh, the new Blizzard bonafide, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, in my flash review of that ski, which if you're a blister member, you can read that. Um, people know, like if we go back to two previous versions of the bonafide, I called that ski perfect for what it was. Then there was a change to the ski. I still thought it was a good ski, but it lost a bit of precision. And so it, I personally just wasn't as excited about that. And then this new one, I'm back to being like, holy cow. So honestly, Blizzard's got two for me where, and that's, that's just really exciting. I mean, mm -hmm. especially I think, well, they're both exciting, but to have that Cochise back in a spot, you know, mm -hmm. that it occupied for such a long time where we were like, for the right skier, this thing is, uh, is a hell of a good time on the mountain. So yeah, I'll go. Those are my two from Blizzard. Cool. Um, closing it out, the Vocal Revolt 104. Um, we actually got a, one of the questions was about this. Um, that's another ski that we got very late, um, but I really like it so far. Um, and I really, really liked the one, the Revolt 121. But something interesting I've noticed with actually several of the vocal skis we currently have is I started looking at their core profiles. So like how thick this ski is and an interesting thing with everything from the Revolt 104 to the Blaze 106, which is a lightweight touring ski, which is also very good to even like the Mantra 102, they don't have a spot where they get drastically thicker hmm. in the core profile. A lot of skis like have really thin tips yeah. and then thick cambered sections. So what that translates to is really soft tips and really stiff underfoot. But I think maybe one of the reasons I've been getting along with every vocal ski I've skied in the past two years is that like super smooth transition and a lack of a like there, you can bend the front of the ski and on the revolt, you can bend the back of the ski too. And not just the very ends of it. Um, anyways, just something kind of curious that I noticed. Um, but regarding, regarding the revolt 104 in particular, um, it's fairly lightweight, but the suspension feels nice for what it is so far. Um, and I, it has like my favorite type of rocker profile where the rocker lines are super deep but they don't rise abruptly. So once you lay it over, you can actually yeah. engage most of the ski on edge. So anyways, excited about that. And then also, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of surprised you didn't say it, but the Katana 108, the vocal Katana 108 is- Me Meaning uh, you're surprised I didn't mention it for a potential best of? Yeah. Okay, go. Cause I mean, like we said, we got that one, like you got to spend time on yeah. the coaches. Um, we got the katana really late, but mostly I mention it because of, despite not being in really in my wheelhouse, like I like mostly playful skis. The Mantra 102, I think is a phenomenal ski. Amen. And we did give it a best up this year after spending more time on it. And the Katana 108 looks really similar. So it just makes me think it's probably gonna be really good. Yeah, I think, and my take on that is a little bit, and this might be a bit unfair. So one, you're right. We will spend more time. We may come around. That Mantra 102 is so freaking good that it, I don't know, like it's, I can't in my mind get around. It, by the way, I think the Mantra M5 is really good. Mm -hmm. It's different. 
especially in that, again, we've only been able so far, and I hope we can change that this year, we've only skied the M5 in a 177 length, whereas we skied the Mantra 102 in a 184. So it's not a direct apples to apples, but um, that 102 is so good that I don't, if the, if the Katana 108, if we end up feeling like, oh my God, the the wider one is also like mind blowing. Mm-hmm. They're just rolling strikes, is what they're doing. Yeah, it's also curious to me, like that they t- they made it a one hundred eight. Um, the the gaps are pretty tight. Uh huh. And like the M five, like it's it's ninety six hundred foot, I believe, and I guess it features their traditional like single radius design, and the Mantra one hundred two and the Katana one hundred eight get their triple radius design which makes people get freaked out because it says it has a 19 meter radius and it's not really a 19 meter radius yeah but anyway um yeah given how similar the 108 and the 102 look it'll be it'll be interesting to see um like who we think should be on one over the other yep yep where do you want to go um kind of on a related note but we labeled this topic as like sleeper skis, yeah. skis that maybe don't get as much attention. Um, maybe they're not super flashy in one particular regard, but that we think a lot of people should be considering. Um, and one that you ended up spending more time on this year was the Armada Tracer 108. Yep. Yeah. Um, first of all, wonderful introduction to this section. You said exactly like... I don't know, we might find ourselves really excited or talking a lot about a particular ski, you know, so on and so forth. And when you're going back over a buyer's guide like this, certain skis will come to mind. And and it's sometimes I, I think about, was there a good ski that somehow maybe we didn't talk about enough that would work really well for a lot of different people? And so that's kind of what motivated this section or this topic. And yeah, I did end up spending a lot of days out um, on that Armada 108, which is usually a signal that I kind of like the ski because otherwise I'm not going to spend many days on it. Um, and I think we've already kind of given the punchline. Like for somebody who just isn't really sure and isn't really specific about what they want in either a 50-50 ski or in a touring ski, um, I do think it's worthwhile for us to be able to kind of throw out that pretty safe choice, right? And it's funny, like I think there are analogies too. If you want to go to coffee or whiskey or wine, it's like a lot of people are just going to get along well with one of these. That's kind of my answer to the Armada trace 108 Mm -hmm. and uh so it doesn't leap out about all these things that it is you know and i think we often do grab on or latch on to those things where a ski is really stand out in a specific characteristic Mm -hmm. that's not the that's not the armada um but that's kind of also why who is going to get on that ski and utterly hate it kind of hard to say unless you're one of those people who has an extremely specific performance envelope. But if that's you, then frankly, picking out skis should be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, 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 I'd agree. And like, especially in the guide where we're limited to like, we're usually trying to stick to 165 words, which like is someone asked about the hardest part about the guide, cutting down blurbs to that size. Yeah. It's really challenging. Um, but yeah, it's like for skis, like the tracer 108 and like the, some of the others we're about to talk about, like it's easy if a ski, like the Dina star M pro 118, super loose and really yep. damp, really easy to write about yep. and grab people's attention. Yep. But skis like the tracer, it's like, no, it's not going to like wow you when like, it's not going to float the best or like be super energetic, but for a lot of people, that's you want predictability not just like a ski that's really good at one thing yeah um yeah by Uh, the way i'm gonna give myself credit i'm super good 
at cutting down blurbs. Like another behind the scenes take is like Luke will often be like, can you figure out how to cut seven words out of this paragraph? And I'm like, I got you, Luke. I'm like a word cutting ninja. No? Well, sometimes I have to replace some words because all of a sudden <laughs> when we're doing these at like 2 a.m i'm like yeah you cut 10 words but this does this isn't english anymore <laughs> okay maybe i'm not quite quite there i'll keep working on it <laughs> you just highlight a sentence and hit delete and you're like i'm so good at this <laughs> um, that's a, that's actually one of the fun fun parts though is i often get these texts and it's like if you can pull four words out of this or something. And I'm like, those are fun. Like I don't do crossword puzzles. That's like my version of the crossword yeah. puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a whole, it's just a blast putting this thing together. <laughs> Especially uh, at 2 a.m. Yeah. Um, on my end, um, this is kind of both a ski that I don't think should be slept on and that has a lot of potential. The more, like we we got time on it starting in the spring is the new Majesty Superwolf. Um, I mean, the long story short of my review was that I would be equally content skiing that or the Solomon Mountain Explorer 95. And that Solomon Mountain Explorer 95 is one of the best skis I've ever skied yeah. for what it is. Yeah. So that's extremely high praise yeah. for the Superwolf. Um, and yeah, basically like folks out there who want a ni like low 90s underfoot touring ski that doesn't suck when you ski, it's really good. Um, it's not hooky. It's damp for its weight. It's still quite light and like much more versatile than most skis I've used that narrow. So all in all, a very, very good ski and a bit of a surprise, honestly. Are we allowed to talk about my the ski that I've enjoyed talking about like the most over maybe the last two or three months? Uh, the QST 99? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we need to talk about the Solomon QST 99 because while like this is not my personal favorite ski, you know, in the world, I think it is so good. I think a ton of people should be on this ski. And, you know, while it doesn't have like the biggest, flashiest, coolest looking graphic or something in the world, in my opinion, it's just so good. And, uh, you know, I think I made this statement maybe on a previous Gear 30 podcast where, you know, like for some years we'd see a ton of people in, in uh, lift lines on like a Razi Soul 7 or something. All those people should go beyond a QST 99 now. And if we saw that's a ski, I hope when I roll up into a ski line at whatever ski area in the world, if I saw a ton of those on people's feet, I'd be like, yep, you're going to have a good day out here. It, Cause one of the things that b blows my mind and I hate is how often we're kind of looking at skis in the ski line. And it sort of becomes a bit clear, like that ski's probably not doing you any favors today, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and maybe the highest praise we can offer that QST 99. Um, and I don't know if I said this first, I think maybe you did. I don't want to give you credit. This is so good. The point is so good. I don't want to give you yeah, credit. I, if, I was the one who said okay, it. We'll give you credit. <laughs> I guess it was Luke who was like, you know, that QST 99 is kind of now the new Nordica Enforcer 100. Mm -hmm. And as many of you know, we have been just rolling best of awards to that Nordica Enforcer 100 for I don't even know how many years in a row now. It was four or five. Four or five. <clears throat> Nordica made a decision to change the Enforcer this year. They're, it's fine, they're, prerog they're prerogative, but it is a heavier ski now. It is a burlier ski. It is less forgiving it is a bit more game on and frankly if it was me i would not have changed that ski if i i feel like nordica did actually kind of shrink the performance envelope of the enforcer 100 
it's not to say it's a bad ski. I just think you kind of need to be a better skier now mm. and a stronger skier na- skier now. And I'm kind of like, you had a ski that we used to say for years, I would not hesitate to put a heavier beginner, like literally has never skied before. I would put them on that Nordica 100. And I think very good skiers can go have a good time on that ski. And maybe some of those people would want a bit more ski or something, but still massive, massive envelope. That's the QST 99 now. And the new, well, now if I'm asked, okay, well, if the Nordic Enforcer 100 just went a bit more to the like best saved for advanced and expert skiers, that QST 99 is who I would put a, I've never been on skis before and I'm, you know, I've got a bit of weight, you know, I don't know, call it 175, 175 pounds and heavier. And Mike freaking Douglas loves that ski. In case anybody's worried that it sounds like we're just talking about some ski for newbies here, right? And uh, I loved it too. It was in a some Cody Townsend post the other day where Cody was talking up the QST 118. And I saw that that Mike chimed in and was like, nah, don't worry about it. Just, just get the QST 99. And I was like, right on there, Mike. So anyway, I'm done. That's what I have to say about the QST 99. Okay. Well, I don't have much to add. It's a really good ski. And... I guess the only thing I would say is that I would <clears throat> I would recommend the QST 106 to almost as many skiers. The new version? Yeah. Okay. I think it's very like good suspension, lets you ski it hard, but not demanding. Um, so yeah, that's all I'd add on that. Um, the other ski that like as I'm talking to a ton of Blister members, like especially this fall. In addition to the QSTs, the other ski that keeps coming up is the Dina Star Menace 98. Hmm. And that ski is really good. And I think Dina Star is doing themselves a disservice by marketing it as a freestyle ski because it comes with a recommended mount point of around minus seven from center. Meter, or from center. And I mean, it also includes mount points up to like minus two, I think. But a lot of people see the twin tip on it, think it's a park ski. I'm not interested in park skiing. I would encourage anyone who's looking for a all mountain ski that carves really well, is quite damp, can be pushed hard, but also has a forgiving flex pattern. Like the, the Menace 98 should be on your list and don't get scared by its twin tip. But also like people who do have a freestyle background and want something that they can drive through the shovels and that is pretty damp and stable should also check it out. Um, finally on this section, the white dot Altum 104 and 114 um, were some of the skis I really, really enjoyed last season. Um, excuse me. Basically, they remind me of the Moment Wildcat and Moment Wildcat 108. And if you look at the shapes, um, they're pretty similar. So are the flex patterns. But basically, the Altums... I, I think are a little bit better for people who want something that carves a little bit better. They have more of that low slung rocker profile where the, whereas the wildcat skis kind of rise fairly abruptly. Um, but in the end, I was like pretty content skiing either of them, um, either the wildcats or the altums and basically loved each of them for the same reasons. So and as people know, at least for me, like those wildcats are some of my favorite skis. So again, high praise um, this time to White Dot. I kind of want to get moving pretty soon here to like all the questions we got in. Mm-hmm. But are there any other sort of overarching takeaways you had, you know, kind of looking at all of the current skis on the market now, you know, because I, I think it's maybe kind of interesting to think about like, all right, well, we've got the whole 2021 batch of stuff. Are we psyched on it? Are we disappointed in it? Is there a trend where we're like, that's a good trend or that sucks? Like two years ago, like we liked what the entire market kind of collectively looked like better. What are your thoughts? I would say I'm liking the trends. Um, <clears throat> I mean, as we noted all the way back in outdoor retailer, like 
we saw several companies come out with skis that were not very light and were built with like stability and variable yep. conditions in mind. And I think most notably, this was when we're looking at our all mountain, more stable section and our all mountain chargers sections, yep. chargers, like, first of all, like the Katana name came back. Yeah. And the pro, the Dina Star Pro Rider is now essentially back as the M Pro 105. Yep. And in like our all mountain more stable section, in like the past two years, like a lot of the skis were like really light, and especially in like the damping and suspension category, there were a lot of skis in there that were not very good. But now this year, we we're like, man, like this, the middle of this spectrum is really difficult to like suss out the individual differences, like one ski right next to each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good trend. Like there's still plenty of lightweight skis out there, yeah. but it's nice to have some um, like diversity in the ski market. Yeah, and what I totally agree. And what I think is interesting is I think we are seeing a number of companies put the weight back into a number of their inbound skis. But I also think that if you look at the range of backcountry touring skis out there, they are lighter than they used to be. Like weights are coming down, I think. And, and in terms of like the, the weights of skis that we think actually ski well, I do think that bar, like it used to be for me, if it's less than 2000 grams, I probably am not going to want to be on that thing. And now I can name quite a few skis under 2000 grams that I think up hold, that I think hold up really well to fairly hard skiing in the backcountry. So like, I think that it's, so I'm, I guess my point here is it's kind of like good job ski industry in the sense of like put weight back into inbound skis when people are going to be riding freaking chairlifts, but where we're going to be walking up a mountain, I think they've done a good job of figuring out how to get a bit lighter and in some cases quite a bit lighter while while improving that downhill performance so mm -hmm. yeah i'm mostly just glad that like company most companies have realized that a tour the best touring ski in the world isn't the stiffest and lightest yeah like, dumbest trend ever don't like just putting 10 layers of carbon fiber wrapped around a Polonia core isn't the recipe for success, no. which apparently everyone thought it was like five or six years ago. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The hey, industry is looking good. Let's stay on that point because you never want to pass up an opportunity to leave a good rant on the table. Light and stiff is the stupidest thing in the world, whether it's an inbound ski or a backcountry touring ski. It is a shitty combination. And if you want to make a ski with the world's worst suspension, you should go that route. And I seriously, like, we've been doing this for a lot of years now. And, like, you're just going to make for a really gross, terrible feeling ride. And so you, I'm saying this because you said backcountry skis should not be made really light and really stiff, but no ski should. So again, we've been banging that drum for a while, but we needed to get at least one drum beat in, you know, because otherwise it wouldn't be blister. Yeah. But yep. Um, is that it? That's all we have to say about the buyer's guide? I'm sure we'll have more to say at some point, but um, I think for the sake of time, we move on to some of all of your questions. Um, what did we have? Let me go one more. What was the biggest argument you and I had about the guide this year? I don't remember like uh, a... I don't remember anything. Like I said, I black out every year. Um, <laughs> Perfect. I, yeah, I don't know. There's definitely a point in the guide process, especially late in it, where if you have a really strong opinion about something and I like kind of disagree with you, I'll just be like, yeah, whatever, sure. <laughs> I appreciate your your... In those moments, you realize it is probably just good to go with the wiser, more sound. Mostly, I just want to get it done. <laughs> Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm usually right, so <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, for reference, um, we got a ton of questions on Instagram, and for some reason, 
either I'm an idiot or Instagram still doesn't have a way to export those questions to some easily readable document. So I was trying to type them onto a laptop and I definitely made some spelling errors errors, and I'm definitely going to mispronounce a lot of these usernames. So apologies for in advance in, in advance for that. It's nothing personal. I'm probably going to do it to everyone else. Um, with that said, uh, we're going to try and go over some of the questions we got and we will likely be saving several of these for the future. Yeah. Um, to start off, um, let's go with from mediocre ski memes. What's the worst ski you have ever been on? Full stop, no cheating. You want to go? You can go first. I mean, the worst ski or skis I've ever been on, no question, it's it's when we've gotten a ski with an utterly screwed up tune, right? And it's not one company that has done that. Several brands have done that, like forgotten to like bevel the edge. And um, so that's been the most terrifying uh, experiences for sure. And that's a solvable problem, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Other than that, you know, just keeping it real and keeping it honest, there was a, it may have been when Amplid came out with one of their first skis. It's like, if you have a sense of what I like in a ski, this was literally <laughs> the, the exact opposite on every single point. You, there was, it, you couldn't have come up with a ski where like on paper and in theory, I would have been more against everything about its existence. And um, I'm not sure we ever reviewed that ski because I, I, it was like maybe one of the only times I've just been like, I'm not going to put words. I, I refuse to, I'm not going to figure this thing out. So apologies, but like of the, I don't know, thousands of skis we've been on, that was the one instance where I was like, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember the name of it. That's where I- it was called I, the Alter Ego. Oh. It was like super fat shovel, really tight radius, really soft, really light. Heavily tapered tip, but like flat tail Mm -hmm. and a weird mount point and a ton of camber underfoot. Mm -hmm. It was everything made no sense. Yeah, I think it was from like six or seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That was the worst ski I've ever been on. Um, So, yeah. Yeah, on my end, I feel like the good news is no single ski jumped to mind. Um, it's rare that I get on a ski and I'm just like, this will never, ever work for anyone. Um, I have, like like you said, I've been on skis that were railed or like super edge high. And one of those actually was, well, it wasn't edge high. It was just wildly sharp. It was the Fisher Ranger 102 FR, which is one of my all-time favorite skis yeah. now. But the first time I got it, I was like, I can't turn. Um, it was scary. And it was like a basin late in the season Perfect. where <clears throat> you all get funneled onto yeah. one run that feels like it was groomed by a snowcat with hydraulics or something because all of the groomed tracks are just like not the same level and just massive bumps. And anyways, um, but once I detuned the hell out of it, it was great. <laughs> um but I think the only ski that really comes to mind is the the old version of the Scott Scrapper 105, mm. um, mostly because the first day I skied it, it was combined with another really bad product. But basically, we like I, I think I've told this story before. We hiked up a couloir and skied in what was either really firm, steep snow or really crusty, grabby, terrible challenging conditions and it would switch the moment you cross the shadow and i was on the scrapper it was my first day i had already detuned the tips and tails just by the look of it because it had no taper basically and then i was in the the original head core one boot um yes and basically thought i was gonna die like i couldn't ski and i would either get too far over the front and fold the boot in half or i would get two back seat and the scrapper would just run away. Um, but anyways, that was that was the only one that really came to mind. 
I want to get to another question that Mediocre Ski Memes asked us. Um, if you had to pick between using only a Tele binding or a 2006 Speed Radical, which would you choose and why would you kill yourself? It's a little harsh, I but know. I would go Tele binding 100%. 100% me Never too. Never Tele skied, but I would like people. People choose to do that all the time. Yep. Even in the resort. Yep. The only people I know who choose to ski on 2016 if it's are like super hardcore old ski touring dudes who I'm just like respect. Yep. But I am not as, I'm not as <clears throat> like my values are not as strong. I need to have a better binding than yeah. that. That's funny. I th I wasn't sure if you were going to go the other way on that question. No so basically, we just said we would both opt right now to go do a thing that we've never done as opposed to being in that 2006 radical. Yeah. Quite quite a statement. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Um we still we got a telly. Yeah, I mean, we've got to make the video and uh yeah. I mean, I want the, the snow to pile up so that it's softer when I'm wiping out. Um, get you some knee pads. Yeah, I got to get me some knee pads. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, let's 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 keep it moving. What, where are we going next? Cool. So um, this is a really good question from, uh, apologies, a Akila Skates and or John underscore MC1. Um, in the annual buyer's guide, there are so many men's ski sections and only one for women's skis. I feel like we miss out on some of the value of the men's ski categories and spectrums. Any plans to split out the ladies' skis into categories, given that they range from frontside to powder? Go um, ahead. So, yeah. Yeah, this is definitely, this is something we've um, been considering in the past and basically that we're planning on implementing, especially in the digital guide next year. Um, but in years prior, our women's skis section was even smaller. We think it is, I mean, I think it was like 36 skis this year, which is significantly larger than past years and something we're really thankful for from our, our female reviewers. Um, but yeah, basically the plan is to expand that and make the spectrums more useful in the future. The main, in addition to it being smaller in the past, the print guide page limits are a thing and yeah. unfortunately like like including like our apparel section has gotten smaller in the print guide especially because our guide is already over 200 pages and it's already incredibly expensive on our end to ship because of its weight and, and size and print and, and print yeah. to begin with um but anyways yeah we totally agree we're working on that and we're hoping to make it even bigger than uh than this past year next year and I'd also say that if even even though we're grouping them into that one section, the work that our female reviewers does, I think outmatches any other buyer's guide, even if they do split them up into 90 underfoot and 105 underfoot. Agreed. So just a couple other points. Um, one, I do think that we still have as many skis in our women's section as most other buyers guides out there so i don't i don't actually know if we're first or not but to reiterate your point like i will go to the mat in terms of saying that what we've not you and me but what our our uh, female reviewers have written about that stuff is far more valuable i think than what you're going to find elsewhere and so we will continue to grow, you know, that side of things. The only other thing I do want to say, and we have talked about this in the past a bit, I personally, and other people don't have to be in my same position here. I just personally don't love the idea of women's specific skis. And I think, I know that is a question in the industry, in the ski industry, in the bike industry, in other industries, but I think in ski in the ski industry, unisex skis is what makes the most sense. And so I'm not that motivated to try to blow up this and, and kind of perpetuate this women's women specific 
side of things when it comes to gear because I frankly think that's a I personally think that is a wrong way to look at this equipment. I care a lot more about how aggressive of a skier you are, what is your weight. And frankly, a lot of the women who've reviewed skis for us shred a lot freaking harder than a lot of guys out there. And and I, I just think it's an outmoded old old thing that um if I got to have a say in terms of where the ski industry heads over the next five to ten years. I would like to see a proliferation of a more of a unisex build some skis that are length appropriate for people of different heights or weights or whatever, and then put some different cool top sheets on it. And I'll take the pink one and the women can have the black one or whatever. Like, but like, that's just my take on that. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm on a related note, like Fisher did that with at least the Ranger 102 FR. I think they did it for the 94 FR yep. where all they did was it's the same ski, but it's available in lengths from like, I want to say like maybe low one fifties all the way up to a one ninety one. Yep. Um, and then they offer it in a blue top sheet and a pink top sheet that looks amazing. Amazing. Um, we'll take the pink one for all yeah. the women who are like, I don't want it pink. We'll take the pink. Yeah. Pink looks sick. Most, but they haven't, or like, I don't really know what their position is on the other skis in their line. They might just be unisex, but they're not offering them in different colors. But mostly I'm, I'm curious to see how that pans out. And then yeah. like, like faction or a lot of companies now just do like different top sheets, shorter lengths. Yep. Anyways. I, and I, and yeah. last thing to say maybe. So, you know, for this person asking a very good question, the other thing that we would want to say is, women should not limit themselves to only looking at the women's skis section. And we say that in the class overview, the introduction to that section. Conversely, dudes that are of the right size or you know aggressiveness or whatever should take a look in that section as well. So this is just not something that we hold in some like I'm just not at all going to the mat for like gender specific ski equipment or especially skis, right? If we get into ski boots and different last sizes and the rest, there's maybe a better case that can be made, but not, not for skis. Um, so anyway, that's our take. Cool. Um, next question. Where does the name blister come from? The name blister. I feel like I must have talked about this at some point at somewhere. some point but i don't really remember where um basically before blister existed and i was thinking of this company and what we would do um you know i was i knew that when we launched i wanted to launch doing uh ski equipment snowboard equipment mountain bike stuff and climbing stuff. And I remember sitting, I remember vividly like sitting in my office uh, and I was like, what is the thing that kind of unifies those sports? And the night before I had been at the climbing gym and I was bouldering and I was like picking at a flapper uh, on my hand. And then that, this more that next day that morning i had skinned a lap and then ridden bikes in the afternoon and so i had just kind of come from a you know 24 hours done three different sports and i'm picking at this flapper on my hand and i had was developing a blister on my heel from skinning and uh on the mountain bike ride my hands were getting pretty agitated from you know from the flapper from climbing and um, I don't know. I just kind of liked at the time, um, one, I wanted a name that would be memorable. Um, and I thought like, well, the people that are really like getting out there and going a lot, you end up with blisters and calluses a good bit of the time. Um, I also really liked the connotation of like blisteringly honest, because that was, if you couldn't tell by now, that was a hundred percent the goal of what we would be doing. Um, and, uh, and then finally, like, again, if you come back to like, this thing didn't exist and 
I very much like the connotation of, you know, this blister is this tiny little spot on your heel typically or hand or something, but, but every single step you take, you feel it. And I remember thinking like, you know, we were coming in to kind of overturn an industry and a way a pretty gigantic industry worked and being nothing, uh, we didn't exist. No one, certainly no one knew who we were. I thought, you know, we'll be that thing that is tiny, but it agitates and you kind of can't ignore it. And uh, that's kind of the origin story. Here we are. Cool. <laughs> um, from Taylor Ahern, does Jonathan ever sleep? Taylor Ahern. Taylor, uh, shout out to Taylor. He is the photographer behind our very cool cover photo of the guide starring Luke Kappa. He somehow managed to make me look decent. Right. Skiing. Taylor Ahern is so good. Did the impossible. <laughs> He's so good as a photographer. He made Luke Kappa look good. Uh, I love that photo. Everybody kind of loves that photo. But uh, so Taylor um, is our good friend, um, very good photographer. He's also one of our podcast editors and he's been great to work with. Um, you know, honestly, I, my life is getting better on the sleep front. Like, so I still work a lot, but I'm not, it's not, it's getting better. And I, I'm really making a point of that, you know, like I, I'm not trying to die or, you know, and uh, so anyway, like I, I am actually trying to d get better about the sleep thing, though Taylor being our podcast editor sees in like Google Drive when, <laughs> like when, I'm, yeah. when file, files are being uploaded. Uh, and I'm it's, guessing that's where this question yeah, came from. <laughs> it's often quite late, but I, I'm trying. The thing I want to give a shout out to too is, you know who doesn't sleep much at Blister? Is Justin Bob. And I'm going to be, we need to, we, we have been promising to do a J-Bob episode where I think he and I just get really drunk. But uh, J-Bob is killing it at life right now. And like that guy is just murdering it on all these different fronts. And he is a phenomenal father and he is a firefighter and he is a podcast producer and he will be producing this one. But my shout out goes to J-Bob. Like it, there's no way that I'm, there's no way that I'm getting less sleep than J-Bob right now. So J-Bob, I hope you get your sleep someday, but shout out to you for the grind you're on right now. Much, much respect. Cool. Um, syndicate ski and cycle asked, what does it take to get invited to blister HQ? Um, mm. anyone is welcome. The only thing we ask is that you send us an email or what contact us somehow before coming, ideally yeah. a few days or a week in advance, just cause like, so we don't have someone delivering soap while we're trying yeah. to record a podcast conversation right. or, and it like, there's usually a lot going on here. So happy to welcome anyone, show them HQ. Um, but like during the ski season, get out for some laps occasionally. Um, but anyways, yeah, just give us a heads up. I'm going to reiterate this. I don't feel like you said that forcefully enough. <laughs> like, please, please give us that heads up. So if, if, if it's like, Hey, uh, I'm here in Mount CB. Can I come by HQ this afternoon? Assume the answer is no. Um, there's just a lot on our plates right now. But if the more, the more advanced warning and advanced notice you can give us, 100% happy to uh, happy to make it happen. But it's really tough when these things are coming in under 24 hours. Um, and so if it's more like a week, even better. But um, yeah, that's the answer. Cool. Um, from Insta Dan SD. Um, what do I need to do to come work for Blister? Ah, it's a great question. Uh, and as I said, I think early on in this episode, this has been something that you know. I mean, we've actually been working on this for quite a while now, but um, we 
we are looking if you saw our newsletter that was went out last friday i mean we we said like we are going to try to hire a unicorn here and um yeah so i guess be a unicorn is uh is how you get a job here but um i don't know we've said this before and and i don't mean to sound like stupid or redundant about it but like I do still think that there's a lot of people who kind of look at the outside of what we do and it looks pretty cool. There is just a ton of grinding behind the scenes. And so I think if you are that incredibly uh, in, uh, obsessive person when it comes to details, um, if you're willing to work and you like that grind, that's why you should maybe think of working here. Cause if you're like, Oh, it'd be sick. I get to ski a bunch of cool stuff. And then you envision having a ton of time off and shutting it down at 445. Please don't ever apply for a job here. It's just, unfortunately, it's not the space we live in. That sounds lovely. We'd all love that. Mm -hmm. It's just not where we are right now. And you know, we, however good of a job, or however bad of a job we've done, we are trying to keep kicking the bar higher in terms of everything we're doing. And so it's funny, like, you know, I see some companies put out like job calls and it's usually like, come work at this super fun gig and you'll love it. And you get like lunch brought to you and we try to go the other way. We're like, it's gonna be hard. You're probably gonna get yelled at, apologies in advance, but it's true. Like, but we are just committed to kicking that bar as high up as we can. And we need people to understand that. And I'm sorry if that sounds weird or bad. Yeah, I was, I was just like randomly talking to Max Smith at Moment. And it, it sounds like it's a fairly similar story over there. He said some people were coming to interview the guys at Moment and like talking to Luke Jacobson. And they like asked him like, so like, do you guys have any like, ping pong tables or something like where yeah. do you have fun he's like what do you mean have fun like we have work to do and nope that's very much how it is yeah we have no ping pong tables here so if you want that go work <laughs> at google or some slacker company i guess but uh um yeah it's hard we grind and if you don't we frankly don't want you um and i think our i've said this before too but our best people are incredibly sharp they are incredibly detail focused when someone criticizes them, it's kind of taken as a challenge to level up. I mean, I do this to Luke. Luke does this to me. It's an open, like, you know, that constructive criticism comes from all different sides. It's not about being like proving to be right or wrong. It's just, can we keep leveling this up somehow? Because the alternative I feel like is you go out of business. And to be honest, well, We've seen some of the going out of business and we're not trying to do that, you know, and I don't, I don't know a different way than be better every single day and improve on every single thing you do. And again, I don't know how successfully we're doing that, but that is the bar. And um, yeah, so that's why we kind of talk about those unicorns. And when I talk, when I look at a Luke Kappa, you know, when I look at a Paul Forward, um, when I look at a, you know, Julia Van Ralty from back in the day, a number of our best people, they're incredible. And I don't know, just be incredible, make yourself incredible. And that's not natural ability. That's a lot of that is just grind. Mm -hmm. Was that a good job? Uh, I'm trying to I get Luke help. Much Was that a good, it up. did yeah. I do, do you think we're probably going to get inundated with applications now or yeah i don't made it i don't want to be appealing. like i want two like if we got two applications from stellar people that would be fantastic and if some people listening are just like maybe that's i want the ping pong table that's awesome maybe i'll come work at that company too i think you'd go crazy playing ping pong yeah it's only one way to find out, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me where the ping pong tables are. I'm pretty sure there's one in elevation, or at least there's a oh. cornhole game. By the way, I almost forgot. This This actually led, as we were talking about the type of person we need to hire to get help in, 
most, mostly to lighten up your load. Because Luke only cares about lightening up his load. It's not about lightening up my load, Luke. No, it's, you chose to start this company. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite part, absolutely, of the last buyer's guide production when Luke's kind of losing it or I'm losing it and we're talking about we're going to get in more help and we were like, all right, Luke, what exactly do you think we need in terms of the, the person we're looking for? And I was like, do we just need Luke 2.0? You know, like, no, actually, you said that. You were like, we just kind of need to clone me, which I actually thought was like the most arrogant sounding thing. It, Luke. Yeah, it sounds extremely arrogant. Yeah, but then, but then it went even better that he's, he said, and this is basically a quote. He said, I'm basically Liam Neeson. <laughs> and he said, I possess a very specific skill set that few people have. And which would be, mostly useless in yeah. most other jobs to be clear that's why i'm trying to not sound irritated. so the part i wrote i immediately wrote this down when this came out of luke's mouth like luke just compared himself to liam neeson and what was that movie called taken taken and uh i love that that's perfect luke is the liam neeson of blister we also said that i feel like the the tiny bit of tv i've been watching has been like like ai dystopian stuff and we said, like, if we could just make AIs of ourselves that were smarter and that could do everything 10 times faster, um, but they end up killing us in, like, 10 years, we'd be like, sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did say that. That's true. Yeah. If we could have the AI robots that basically just took over our work. But what was it? They would eventually kill us, I think. How long did we say that we'd be I okay I think it ranged, that? like the conversation ranged from like two to 50 years, I think. I think I was like 10 years of just skiing and <laughs> blisters doing its own thing. But then the robots kill you, you'd yeah. be all right. It's, that'd be a, a good, good time. <laughs> By the way, I do also want to say, when I was talking about our unicorns, like we certainly have others. That was not a comprehensive list. Um, of the people I named here at Blister. Those are just some examples. I'm extremely, I am extremely proud of the people that we have associated with this. And, you know, um, I think that some of our people too are just, we're still merging them in and kind of evolving and growing their roles. And so for those reasons, they're kind of like, they're like de developing unicorns. They're like unicorns in training, basically. So... Yeah, I wonder if there's like a term like ponies or small horses. Unipony? <laughs> I don't know. Unipony. Pony corn. N even worse. <laughs> unipony. They're uniponies. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, anyway, uh, how much time do we have left? We got a lot of questions we could go over. Let's go quicker. Okay. Um, let me see. From Annalisa Price. Hi, Annalisa. She asked, best plus size outerwear kit on the market, at least based on the product specs. And this is something that's definitely not, there's like, in my experience, not some super clear answer. But I do think one brand that's definitely caught my eye in that regard and that it has recently started selling in the US is Jack Wolfskin. They are apparently very big in Europe. Um, and as kind of that bigger brand, they seem to focus more on uh, running larger size runs across a lot of products. And I've only um, only started using some of their stuff briefly last season, and it was a insulated jacket, but especially for the price too, the quality seemed really nice. Um, and we're hoping to review some of their stuff, uh, some, of the, some more of their stuff this season. And then another brand, also relatively very new we just literally got one of their pieces the other day but we've been talking to them for a little bit is cortazu um i haven't i haven't looked at their whole line but at least for their technical shells they run them through from xl to double x at least um, a lot of companies out there are just ending at single xl um but we're gonna be testing that basically like starting tomorrow but their the hard shell they sent us super burly seems high quality again just based on specs here uses a high-end dermas x i think ev uh membrane so pretty decent waterproofing breathability 350 bucks pretty good deal for that it seems like so those are the first two that come to mind 
Um, she also asked about system Turing bindings, which I have no experience with, but it seems like a pretty appealing option. I've noticed I've been getting more and more questions. I think as backcountry skiing expands, more people are trying to safely get their kids involved in it and kids have small feet and they don't need high release values. So, I mean, the concept seems great to me. Um, and it, I think it would be cool if more companies would sell demo versions of their AT bindings to the public. Dean, if it's one of the few that does, um, but like we have demo kingpins, um, I think sometimes you can get like a Vipec or a Tecton with like a demo plate on it, but seems like a decent option, especially if you don't need a eight or nine or 10 or 12 release value. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go and I'm going to go quicker than that. Maybe we're so bad at trying to do fast answers. It well, is, it is our worst thing. You need context. You do. I'm not going to, I know yeah. I, I'm bad at it too. So this is probably going to be a much longer answer than I'm, you know, saying it's going to be. I don't know how to say this name. Uh, Blakus Remicus. Blakus Remicus. Uh, what coffee maker did you decide on after, after my chat with Cody? It's a great question, Blakus. Um, here's the answer. Now, I mentioned this in the what we're celebrating component or portion of last week's Gear 30 episode. We're just going to go do a big old deep dive coffee maker rabbit hole on Blister, which is funny because when I told Luke this the other day, he, he gets mad at me when I say we're going to do new things. Yeah. Yeah, he always gets mad at me. But don't you worry. Don't you worry, dear listeners. I just I just stiff-armed Luke. I pushed him aside, and I'm going to run this football across the goal line. We're going to be doing the, like, coffee deep dive, and it's going to be awesome and glorious. And, like, Luke loves coffee, so he's going to end up benefiting from this. He just gets mad when I say, like, hey, Luke, um, we're going to do this new thing. So, yeah. Um, I'm definitely going to have that Mocha Master or Maka Master. I'm a bit confused on the pronunciation of this thing currently. That is definitely going to be in the mix. But the plan is that a number of coffee makers are going to be into the mix. And um, I'm very, very excited for this development on Blister. So there's going to be a lot more coffee talk coming at you. And I think I'm going to put my $10 Walmart one in there too. Just to see is how. it really ten dollars? It was less than fifteen. Okay. Was, I just remember thinking that can't be the right price, but see, it worked for like three years now, I think. Okay. Anyway, great question. What do you got? You go next, Luke. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Um, we're not going to be able to answer all of it, but uh, I don't know how to. <laughs> K Kutvone, K Kutvone. Sorry. Um, I want to know everyone's preferred pole size and some kind of reason for the size they use. Um, we obviously only have us two here, but I usually like poles around 105 to 110. Um, by the traditional scale, you're supposed to like, I think at least, I, I, I think it's for hiking poles. I don't know about ski poles. Like have them the height where your arms are at a 90 degree angle. Yeah. I don't like that. I like shorter than that. Amen. Um, especially cause the only times I really pole plant are in really steep terrain. I'm not pole planting on groomers. As you can see in <laughs> literally every photo of me, <laughs> I'm just dragging them <laughs> and, um, not really using them. Um, uh, so yeah, I like, like one Oh five ish seems to be the sweet spot and then extending them like in the back country can, well, one, it's nice for skating out, but also sometimes I'll just grab a pair of giant poles to look really silly. <laughs> um yeah i roll on the shorter pole length um mostly because we somehow ended we somehow tend to end up in some fairly steep kind of moguled out terrain and stuff and if i'm pole planting in moguled terrain i don't want some wild long pole and um and then i often still do just ski tour with my scott team issue polls that i love um i am not one of these people who is 100 percent anti-adjustable polls and so if i happen to be out with an adjustable pole in the backcountry yeah i may lengthen it um if we're doing a 
like a long skate out or something like that, but I don't know. Um, if you're skiing steeper mogul terrain, airing on the shorter side, I think makes more sense than going long. Mm-hmm. Plus you don't hit yourself in the face with your poles as much. Exactly. Which I did last year. Yeah. Don't do that. That's great. Um, lay underscore moons baggy or tapered snow pants this year baggy tapered end of story yeah baggy um abcd ethan asked when is the light ski touring boot roundup article coming um just talked to paul forward about this today um he's the one taking the lead on that because he has the most experience we are thinking about trying to do one basically an update to an older article he did um but a lot of the boots in that category have been updated and so we'd like to have him actually ski the new ones. Um, Cause like, he'll be able to talk about the atomic backland. Um, he got a Scarpa F1 LT like in the middle of the summer. Um, and then we're trying to get some new options from Dina fit. And then apparently the Solomon X Alp is discontinued now. So anyways, working on that probably won't be happening super early. Cause we actually want to be able to compare several options when we publish it. Mm -hmm. uh one person wrote um why is jonathan ellsworth so friggin awesome and you definitely don't know this person at all uh actually i do that was nick center who was my roommate freshman year in college and is still a good friend of mine so it's probably because of my my freshman year of college roommate i i whatever whatever level of awesomeness also, yeah, we actually played football and basketball against each other in high school. Actually, middle school. Jeez. Yeah. So I probably because of you, Nick. Um, all the all the downsides are my fault, and then any of the good stuff that's probably you, Nick. All right, what do you got? Um, if we're trying to stick to quick ones still. Um, kind of running out of options, but um, our rb romaker <laughs> i'd probably misspelled this one i don't know uh he just says so much gear so little time and money how often should you upgrade i mean never yeah if you uh, my viewpoint is like if you are still having a good time never you don't need to buy new gear yeah if it's broken or you know you hate it time to upgrade yeah. when uh financially possible but in our view and i think it always has been like buying new for the sake of new is not worth it it's like, stupid yeah yeah that's why we have a bunch of old skis around this wall and here that we'll still get on occasionally because some of them are way better than current skis i mean funny right we've talked about this a bit on the bike side of things i would actually have to say in that case if you're i'm sorry but like if your bike is two or three or four years old you can probably go get on something current that will probably feel like a significant upgrade. Yeah, I would say like three plus years. Three plus, yeah. yeah. But when it comes to when it comes to your skis or bindings, if you like them, I mean, now if we're, it's like my bindings are ten years old and I ski a hundred days a year, it's like okay, you might want to like get those to a shop and bench test them and they're probably out of yeah um they're out of warranty anyway but um no like this is one of the things that like our job is to review a bunch of new stuff but if you found that holy grail and you're totally happy for the love of god stockpile Mm -hmm. um and now beacons like replace them every three years probably um But anyway, yeah, like don't replace for the sake of replacing unless you're like, I don't like what this ski or this binding or this boot or this apparel is doing. But if you're happy, be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Quick note on the, you mentioned beacons. We got a couple questions about the peeps. Yeah. Um, Transceiver um, controversy that kind of blew up social media recently. Yeah. Basically, we have an article on the site about it that provides more detail, mostly from other people who are much more um, kind of in tune to everything that's been going on. But basically, the Peeps DSP Sport and the old DSP Pro 
people have noticed a flaw basically on the way the button functions can be accidentally pressed and it will accidentally go from send mode to search mode, um, which is not ideal if you get in an avalanche. And that was likely the case with Nick McNutt. Um, TGR just uh, put out a video about the accident that kind of started this whole thing. Yeah. Um, but basically, look at that article. We go over the details there and um, episode... 119 of the gear 30 podcast with cody he goes into it a little bit on that one from last week or at this point it'll be two weeks ago yeah um but we think anyone who has those specific two beacons should contact keeps they will apparently upgrade it's it's not a recall which is kind of what we expected frankly um but they will upgrade you or um reach out to the retailer and sometimes some of the retailers are dealing with that warranty process um, from what I've heard from some folks. But basically we would not recommend using those two beacons. Yep. Uh, another question, where's Sam Shaheen? Great question. Um, I murdered him. <laughs> Finally, just, I just figured that People who've listened to enough Gear 30 episodes are probably like, that makes sense. That checks out. <laughs> no, um, Sam, one of the things about Sam, uh, and we've known this and talked about this, I think, on certain episodes. Um, Sam, you know, always wanted to work in like the biomedical kind of field. And um, long and short, he was offered a job in sort of the biomedical, I'm gonna keep it sort of vague here, <laughs> biomedical devicey field. Definitely vague on purpose or not because we have no idea what Right, no, doing. totally. <laughs> and you know, honestly, I was, like, I was like, okay, yeah, Sam, I knew that's what you wanted to do. You were looking to do that. Plus I just assumed he would get fired in like four weeks and then he would be back. But it seems like, Sam has not been fired yet, which is mind blowing to me. <laughs> and so um, Sam will still be reviewing for us. We still love Sam and, you know, think he is a hundred percent wrong on things a lot of the time, but uh, we still love Sam. He's doing his thing. He will be reviewing for us. And, um, and we definitely should still make a reviewing the reviewer episode happen with Sam and um but no sam 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 is all good unless his new boss has murdered him for reasons yeah. that are probably very understandable <laughs> so um that's the update but yeah um sam will be back around yeah all right um isaac dot i think i spelled it right um asked what is the what brand has the best goggle technology, e.g. Prism by Oakley, Photochromatic, etc.? Um, I'm planning on doing a, well, one, we're going to be doing a goggle roundup early this season, just going over multiple options because it turns out like a lot of them are really similar, um, which we kind of discuss in our buyer's guide. But in our experience, basically, the more you pay, you're likely getting a higher contrast lens. Like Oakley has Prism, Smith has Chroma Pop, uh, Anon has what they're calling now Perceive, um, Giro has Vivid. They all have some fancy name for it. But basically, those higher end uh, spy happy lens, Zeal something, um, <laughs> all of them offer better contrast, especially in either really low light or really high light conditions. Um, than say most like hundred under a hundred dollar uh, goggles. With that said, personally, I haven't been noticing much of a drastic difference in contrast between those high end high contrast lenses. With that said, I haven't we haven't been able to use uh, Oakley's recent stuff, so that's the main one I want to test. But like from my experience, most of them are quite similar, and I think what's getting really appealing these days is the fact that like from Smith, you can get a squad or squad XL goggle for, I think, I think it's like 140 or $150 with two of their super high end lenses. 
and the only reason you're paying less is because you have to take a little bit more time to swap lenses like the the nice thing is that in a lot of those more generally more expensive brands the high-end optics which is what i think matters a lot trickle down to some of the less expensive options so that's cool to see but long story short i think the more you pay the better contrast you get um especially in the super low light and super bright uh conditions okay and we'll be saying more about that we will be saying more about that um dm sakamoto writes are we still welcome to the blister summit if half of our comments are trying to troll jonathan it's debatable (laughs) i mean i don't know but there there probably is a number and i don't know what that number is where we just delete your name from the blister summit list so it's kind of a one of those playing with fire a little bit (laughs) but you might be fine. It's hard to say. We don't, we don't, we don't know. Maybe. Um, well, first off, Derek, I owe you an email. I'm really sorry about the delay on that. It's been a wild year, but on your note about your other questions, this is an interesting one. Bets on what month shops will sell out of backcountry gear. I think I'd be curious to get, did you talk to Bentgate about this? Yeah. Did they bet? Or make they it, didn't bet, uh, but okay. like answer sooner than later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think especially like the smaller shops that maybe just got a, like, they're not usually super backcountry focused, like just got a few setups that they could. I think either they're already sold out or they're going to be. Um, I don't think it's going to be as drastic of a difference as the mountain bike industry was this summer but i would guess that it's going to be very challenging to get backcountry gear within a couple weeks of christmas probably yeah okay um yeah i i mean i would not wait if you need gear i would not wait or look at the and or look at the used market yeah um it's funny somebody wrote um sam rose mountain or i don't know what that handle is how could someone choose a ski set without trying them it's like um i don't know but people have been reading our reviews for 10 years now and seemingly doing that okay but uh you know if you need to get it on your feet first go do that yeah i would say like there's reading about something is never going to truly replace the actual on snow sensation but i think like like i grew up in the midwest i grew and then went to college on in fort collins which was not close to demos and i didn't have a car and i could probably not afford at the time to do demos so for a lot of people out there trying skis before they buy them is not an option yeah and that's like a big part of why we do what we do because we think we can our, our goal is always to try and just like be the best replacement for a demo basically well but the only other thing i'd say is we've had a number of this comment come in over the years where people have actually said and again this is not to speak for everyone but the comment has come in a bunch like where we've we've had people say like your reviews are actually more helpful than demoing because on an actual demo day one they have very limited amounts of time on the ski Mm -hmm. and it's like one specific condition so that's actually a again i'm not trying to go demo skis like do do your thing like but we've actually seen that for the past 10 years where people are like your reviews are actually more useful than me taking a few runs on a given day whatever the conditions happen to be on on a product that i might be interested in so um that's our answer um yeah but get on skis if you want to get on skis um jacob carter gib asked will we ever review the QSDs center mounted like Cody skis them deep dive article question mark no uh I'm not 
I'm out. If we didn't you have can. the 192, I would do that for sure. We've got demo bindings on them. I actually don't know if they'll go far enough forward. Four centimeters should be all right. Yeah, you could get them. Um, but is... maybe we can convince Paul forward to ski him center mounted. He would hate him. Yeah, he would hate him. <laughs> As, yeah. Sorry, Cody. Um, we should get to what we're celebrating this week and wrap this. Anything? Yeah, so one thing I want to note, per usual we get a lot of questions about like are you going to review this ski why haven't you reviewed this ski why haven't you reviewed this brand um to clarify first off this year's extra weird because yeah. we lost three months of our testing season yeah. so first we have a lot of catching up to do on the brands that have like we already have their product um so that's an extra weird element of this year um in general typically if we've been asked about a ski we've asked the brand about the ski and it, the kind of the ball is kind of in their court um not always the case but most of the time um we are not deliberately ignoring your requests um we also uh can only spend so much time on so many skis yeah. so there is a limit at some point but anyways i'm um, trying to look through these um vishnu wide potentially um they tend to um, sell out of their skis really quickly anyways. Um, Stereo Skis, interesting brand. Um, I can't, I, I feel like I've been in touch with them in the past. Um, their skis look really interesting to me, especially from a touring perspective. So maybe later this season. Um, Rozzy Center Squad, we've had like a million people ask us about this. Hopefully, I don't we'll... think we should walk through every single ski. This is going to now be a new hour of the conversation. And it'll be quicker than whatever you say next. <laughs> Rosie Sender Squad, we will likely get on it later this season. Libtech, working on it. Um, Lithic, definitely going to be in touch with them. Black Crows should be reviewing more. We don't really know. We've tried to get skis from them a decent amount. Um, and hopefully we will be reviewing more. Luke got mad at me because I cut him off. I have been in touch with Stereo Skis. I thought you were going to get mad at me if I was like, yeah, cool we can review these because well, you get mad if at you me just did it but what i would have if you just did it without telling me okay because i try not to get stuff that we, we aren't able to review because we can't review every ski on the market i'm sorry we can't um let's talk about what we're selling are we done or do any uh, did we we get with that we're we we definitely left off some folks i'm sorry if we missed you but we will be doing another one of these in the future we um, definitely will so. and we're going to try to be better about at least once a month doing the your questions and shout out kudos to all of you we got some really good ones in and a lot of them and uh keep them coming and uh luke will try to have better answers for you next time yeah and jonathan will try and not talk as much <laughs> um luke what are you celebrating this week? Um, so I had gone pretty much all summer without crashing on my bike. Uh -huh. And that changed <laughs> a week ago, actually exactly a week ago from when we're recording this. Um, I'm just continually amazed by like, like we, we just spent like so much time talking about like how detail oriented we are and how hard we work. But we still make some really, really dumb decisions. Oh, yeah. Um, including taking a 115 travel bike into one of the steepest, loosest, and rockiest trails around. And then forgetting to unlock the shock because the last time you rode it was on up a paved road. Um, but basically endowed into what is normally... A, well, what is a boulder field and what is normally a ski run. And um, the reason I'm celebrating that is because it could have gone a lot worse. And the guy I was riding with, Blister Reader Will, um, thankfully, <laughs> literally right before it happened, uh, like we had both been riding up with knee pads on our ankles. And he's like, oh, wait, can you hold up? I'm going to put on my knee pads. And I always forget to pull up my knee pads. And so my knees weren't torn up. My legs and my back and my arms were. I'm pretty sure I broke or bruised some ribs, but all in all, could have been worse. And the timing is perfect because, like, we're like riding season will still go on until it actually starts snowing, but like it's not like prime time and skiing is still a month away. 
And I also had about <laughs> yeah, like $2,500 of camera equipment in my oh, pack. This is the first I'm hearing about that part. Yeah, uh-huh. but it was a great test. Um, the Evoc Capture camera hit pack continues to blow me away. Previously, just because of how work, how well it works as a hip pack for mountain biking, but zero issues with the lenses and camera that were inside. Wow. Yeah. So that test, I mean, almost Someone's had you in, do it. <laughs> some, almost had you in the hospital and maybe broke your ribs, but probably not. But yeah. that's the, that's the kind of crash testing we need. Yeah. So. I don't think I'm going to do much more of it on purpose. I hope you um, don't. Yeah. The funny thing is like, like against like good sense, I still needed to ski on Tuesday or Monday whenever it snowed (laughs) and that was totally fine. Like didn't hurt at all, but driving is what hurts the most. Hmm. And like just any sort of pothole, maybe it's how my seat, cause it's like the side of my ribs. And like, I think the like, uh, what do you call those muscles on the side? The intercostals sure (laughs) um that's what hurts a lot and it's just like random movements but all in all like i was wearing a helmet no head no head injury just like got the wind knocked out i mean scraped maybe ribs are a little hurt but yeah could have been a lot worse so you're celebrating could have been a lot worse yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) that's like where the bar is at these days i actually think i did that for one of my a previous gear 30 episode it was i'm celebrating like those crashes when you yeah, actually yeah, get yeah. up and walk away that's ser- that is worth reiterating like we should yeah. be celebrating those things every yeah. single time they happen and like mm-hmm. dodge the bullet so okay uh this week for what i am celebrating uh we mentioned that in this buyer's guide so far We have detected one typo, and I believe that was actually actually a metric thing, where it was like a centimeters and millimeters was swapped. Side cut and the length got swapped. So it's like a metric typo, not even like a misspelled word. And what I would like to celebrate is the fact that if you look at our thank you page in the guide, you will notice that copy editor the copy editor listed is gene ellsworth now that is my mother and god bless her she has become this trusted trusted copy editor and uh because i'm a terrible person and terrible son she has done work for us on past guides and i don't think that i put her name in And shame on me for that. But um, she did a lot of heavy lifting this year on the copy edit side. And I'm not going to, I don't think she gets a a mark against for that metric, you know, switch up. No, it wasn't her job to look at specs. It wasn't her job to look at specs. So she basically is throwing like a no hitter. And I feel like right now, not like, I extremely like so much appreciation for your mom copy editing, but now I feel like you're the guy in the eighth inning who's like, you know, he's throwing a no hitter so far and now we're just going to get a flood of Uh, notifications. That's all right. Anyway, she, she's done a hell of a job. Um, We're super grateful. We are often sending her things and it's like, can you give this to us? Like with very little advance warning, Mm -hmm. Um, she loves to talk about how great Luke is and I'm always like, yeah, whatever. He's all right. But anyway, uh, shout out, uh, shout out to those mothers who step in, help us out, do a great job. And, uh, yeah. So if you, uh, if you had noticed a Gene Ellsworth in the back of the buyer's guide, um, yeah, that's my mom. And and she did a great job making sure the errors were kept to a minimum in this guide. So thanks, mom. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Ellsworth. <laughs> um, that's it. Um, we're gonna get going. Um, yeah, hour and 36 minutes in, I think our work here is done. And- uh, Well, it's never 
Done. Well, it's, no, we're going to get back to work. But um, Luke, great job on the guide. Uh, definitely proud of this one. We're going to try to bring in some some help, more help next year. Um, and uh, till next year when we do this. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, everybody. About ski season. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Take care, and we will talk to you soon. 